Hello, and welcome to another edition of Clock Talk with Dr. Greg Brannon. Greg, thanks for being here today. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate it. Today, we're going to talk about fertility. And there's a very important paper uh, that you've been talking about recently that you want to share with the audience today. Uh, it's the Baylor paper discussion. Mm-hmm. Um, I think in the past, you know, when you talked about infertility, it was always focused on the female more so than the male. But today, I think it's a a little bit of a different story. So why don't you go ahead and start? Yeah, 100%. It's very emotional. I was very fortunate in OBGYN to do a lot of infertility uh, work with patients. When you look at the actual data, 45% of the time it's female. 45% of the time it's male. 10% is an unknown. And I even hate dividing it up because it's always a couple. It's very emotional. The question is, what are the causes? In a woman, we use her cycle. Based upon her cycle, there are certain things you're looking at. You're looking at thyroid, uh, luteal phase. You're looking at the tubes are open. All these things are there. But the very first test before I did anything was always a semen analysis. And what's very interesting is there's quality, there's quantity, there's mobile sperm, all that kind of stuff. But there's, I'm going to go over a paper by Dr. Levin first. This is the newest one from 2002, 2022. From 1973 to 2018, there's been a 1.6% decrease per year per sperm. Okay, stop for a second. What's 1.2%? What does that matter? From 2000 to 2018, it accelerated to 2.6% per year. In quantitative numbers, it was an average sperm count of 104 million per ml to 49. When I was in school, anything under 40 is considered low. Now they consider 20 low. So just to clarify, it's 104 million to 49 million. Per ML. Yeah, per ML. So that's the number one down. So you look at 1% per year, but add it up. Right. So the question is, why are we losing it? There's a lot, a lot of data here, though. But because of that, Dr. Lipschultz from Baylor did this phenomenal paper, and, and Mansowitz has another paper on this. I combined it from the protocol. A couple things are occurring. Then childbearing in general is being pushed out older, and there is more infertility in women and men. Four to ten percent of all men have no sperm already. Hebrew University did a study um, about three, four years ago. She says by 2050, all men in Western Europe, North America, and, and uh, Australia, New Zealand will be infertile. 2050. Okay. All the, men. All men in Western. That's it's it's insane the rate. And you look at it, you go, but Greg, what do you mean all men? In 40 years, I'm from 100 million to 40 million. 40 million to 100. Because when I mean un, infertile, it's under 20. So that, that's, that's only like a 50% drop. We already had a 6% drop. So it can be done. But the question is, why is it occurring? I have these numbers here. At the same time, the childbearing has been in push out. Men's treatment for testosterone therapy has increased tremendously. Men between the age of 40 and 49 have increased 400% getting testosterone therapy. Men between 50 and 69 have increased 300%. And 18 to 36% of men under 35 are looking for testosterone treatment. Why? It's not all for muscle. It's depression, anxiety, motivation, tiredness, libido. It's true in medical reason. The data is through the roof on what that number is going down. So you look at the, you look at the numbers here, one paper from 2012 said that between roughly, it was between 20 and 25, it was uh, 8% of men were under 300. Back to the ranges. When I was in school, a range for a man was roughly 800 or 13, 1400. Today, it depends what lab you go to, it's roughly between 250 and 900. It's been going down because it's correlating with the sperm. So I'll show you a picture here. I know this is a lot of arrows here. But the bottom line is, back to our brain again, the hypothalamus, the antipituitary. Now we're going to talk about gadatropins, FSH and LH. And to make this simple, FSH makes serotoli cells, which makes sperm. LH makes latex cells, make testosterone. Testosterone converts to estradiol and dihydrotestosterone, which helps and aid in spermogenesis, maturing of sperm. And then primary estradiol goes back to hypothalamus in the pituitary to turn off the production of spermatogenesis and testosterone therapy. Great feedback system. 
the problem again lower is I have these great books out of the University of Virginia showing there's multiple factors. Obesity. Phthalates, these forever drugs, plasticizers, BPA, herbicides, atrazines. Big one now with marijuana become legal. Marijuana drops sperm count dramatically. So these things are occurring in today's lifestyle again. Some of these things are in our ability to stop. Some are not. The herbicides, the atrazine, the pesticides, the Roundup, the colors, the plastics. Again, I can't stress, some of these are actually called forever. They never leave your body. So they're hindering the production of this complex system. So what Dr. Lipschitz talks about, okay, we have a fact. Sperm count's decreasing, testosterone's decreasing, and men are looking to get rid of these symptoms. And some of them are debilitating. How can we give therapy to younger men or men in childbearing ranges and still produce sperm? Okay, that's, that's the key because testosterone does decrease what's called the epithelial, germinal, germinal epithelial layer of the testicle that makes the sperm produce. So at extremely high doses, it could make you be a contraceptive for males, but it's, it's not, it's very spotty. But there's never been a paper to show sperm count testosterone level, treatment, treatment later. There's always treatment later, and we know most people rebound between six months and 18 months back where they were before. The problem with the baseline is, again, four to 10% of all men are already have no sperm called azospermia. So when you exclude them, is there a way to have an algorithm that allows you to be treated for your symptoms that are debilitating and still be able to produce sperm? So it goes back to this diagram here. LH is important to make um, to make uh, our 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 latex cell our latex cells make sperm uh, testosterone that's spermogenesis. So latex cells, LH has a alpha and a beta component um, subunits. HCG, which is made from human placenta, is called human chronic uh, gonotropin, keeps the baby inside the womb while the progesterone is kicking in. So what happened? Well, the placenta is taking over. Well, they found that the alpha unit and the beta units, the alphas are identical. The beta is, is close to the uh, of the LH. So you could trick the woman to ovulate with HCG. You could trick the woman, man to make uh, to make testosterone and sperm by being on it. That's one way to do that. Another way is that you block estrogen called SERMs, selective estrogen receptor modules, back in the brain to trick the brain. There's no estrogen, so therefore make more testosterone estrogen. The clomid way makes both increase FSH and increase LH. Uh, HCG helps increase sperm. But here's the thing, Jim. The problem is when people are on testosterone therapy, and I've had we've had hundred, you know scores of patients now, the wives don't want them off the testosterone because they're feeling so much better. Their life is better. Their depression is gone. Is there a way to actually keep them on the testosterone therapy? and do the sperm. That's a combination of both these books here. So the algorithm he has is you stop for six months and try. And then you go, then you do is you mimic, you mimic HCG. The problem is with HCG, it's been shown that HCG works great by making the body make up an LH, but at higher doses, it actually turn off in the body's own FSH. Clomid increases both. So the studies show that he has a 70% pregnancy rate Oh, sperm, not pregnancy, wrong answer. Increase sperm count with HCG alone, and some of you will have to add clomid. So it's a combined program. And then, um, so the protocol is six months sooner, stop all therapy, do HCG 3,000 3, units every day, every other day, and, and plus or minus add clomid every other day. If you wait between six months and 12 months, then have 500 units of, of, of HCG every other day, and then add clomid. If it's over 12 months, just continue your continue testosterone therapy as going. But again, we found in our practice that we're using that, we're modifying that protocol, doing HCG 3000 um, uh, IU sub Q every other day with Clomid 25 milligrams every other day and continuing the pellet therapy. And we're having the couples that want to get pregnant have to be getting pregnant. So it's a way of letting the germinal layer still grow by tricking the body to make it grow, making sperm, but still keep the testosterone levels in optimal ranges. Go in a little more detail about what HCG is and does. Okay. And same with Clomid. Beautiful. So back to our picture up here. When you look at LH, see what that does there. Again, FSH makes sperm. LH makes 
testosterone, and they mature together. So picture HCG comes from placentas to keep the baby in the womb, but it looks extremely close to LH. It looks so close that when you give HCG, it can trick the body for a woman to ovulate and can trick the body to make sperm. That's what HCG does. And if you look back at these red lines, these red lines are where, uh, is where uh, estrogen goes back to the brain to turn off the production. So if you impede that, it would trick the body to make no estrogen dial. So your body would make more FSH and LH to continue the sperm and testosterone. That's how Clomid works. The problem with Clomid is it can make decreased bands of libido desire because it's, it's blocking the hypothalamus, which is important in desire of the actual desire of libido. But it does work for that process. Again, it appears that a combination of both has a very high pregnancy, pregnancy, not pregnancy sperm oh, production. Yeah. Yeah. But again, it's, it's tricking the body to continue production while you've given a higher supply of testosterone. Are these drugs, are they supplements, or are they steroids? They're, they're drugs. The, the, uh, by strict definition, LH is a peptide. It's, okay. it's, uh, it's, it's uh, covalently bond proteins. And the HC, uh, the clomid is, a, again, it's a selective estrogen receptor modulator. So it, ba- it's, it, looks, it looks like estrogen, but it's an antagonist. It's not an agonist. And it blocks it there. So therefore, your body thinks you have no estradiol. So you have a couple that's trying to get pregnant, they're running into some problems. The treatment you just described, is that first line of defense or is that a third or fourth option after you have to go through other things first? Good. It's two things. First off is 40% of people on treatment will have no low sperm. So I'd like to first test, again, regardless if the husband is on, is on testosterone or not, get a sperm count. Because if a sperm count is good and he's on testosterone, no need to do anything. That's why I believe in a couple trying to get pregnant, the first test should be a, a man's semen, regardless. Now, we know he needs sperm, so how are we going to increase the sperm? That's when the protocol comes in. Now, we obviously check the woman to make sure the woman ovulates. And we don't do that here at Optimal Body, but my other life, I did that. Make sure they ovulate with progesterone levels. On day 21, you want above 10. That's not working. Make sure the tubes are open, called H C uh, histosapingogram. There's things to do on that workup. Now, the workup is done, and you know the cause is low sperm from testosterone. What we think from a testosterone, remember, 4 to 10% have it already. We don't know that. So now the option is quit the testosterone for six months. First line of his paper, do that first. But what if he doesn't want to change? And that's where you can add this protocol to that. And that's where you add that to that. And then what you do is four to six months after the protocol, repeat a semen analysis and therefore to see if they can stay on it and make sperm. If they can't, you have to go off of it because there's a rebound effect, like I said, through six to 18 months. Do you really believe that by 2050, every Western male will be? Every word we use, that word effort. I know, I know how exact person you are. So I know the words you're saying. I'm, I'm sure, sure some people say believe it. I believe we are at a downward spend right now. Jim, Jim, this is not mind boggling. 50% of the countries in the world have less than two kids. You need two kids to break, keep your population even. So under the, my, other than migration, you're gonna have a lower population base. So that's what's occurring right now. The problem is that, Jim, is that whatever the cause is, the multiple, heavy metals, everything we talked about, it's doing something to this complex procedure. So regardless if you want one kid, no kids, a thousand kids, we got to stop this kind of this kind of aspect of this thing being hindered. It's just so multifactorial, and there's ways to go around that. But I do believe you look at areas that have less phthalates, less BPAs. They do have a higher sperm count rate spontaneously. I think also, you know, sperm count is obviously extremely important. But I think you described the other day to the other PAs that you have the egg and the sperm has to hit it at what 60, 64 degrees 64 horizontal. horizontal degrees. <laughs> Otherwise, it's never getting in. And that's right? crazy. <laughs> the, the thing, Joe, is that thing, everything should get pregnant. If, uh, if a woman, if they, if they are intimate at the exact proper time, that window of three or four days, the pregnancy rate is 20% per month, period, in the under 30. Over 35, it goes down to so fungibility. Uh, to around 39, it's about, seven, it's about 15%. It is a very complex issue, 100%. But the more sperm gives you more chance. Right. But for, I can't stress being OB for 30 years. Fertility is so emotional. That's why before any man starts this in our place, we bring the, husband, the wife in, 
or the girlfriend, and I go over this for hour, the whole chart, so there's a f informed consent prior to anything occurring. Fantastic. As always, another great day.